We'll call this meeting of the Ethics and Elections Committee together to, to order. And today is Wednesday, March 27th. It's about 12 after 12. And uh, we'll do introductions starting with Dick. Dick Training. Gretchen Wemhoff. Natalie Wilson. Barbara Jones. Austin Quinn Davidson. And I'm the Chairman Pete Peterson, and we'll go right to new business. Let's get an elections update. Elections update. Well, guess what? Today is E minus six. <laughs> so um, six days until the election, um, or until election day. Um, things seem to be going fairly well. We have received um, 29,000 ballot envelopes as of today. Um, we have a daily report that goes out yesterday. We had 22,000. Um, interestingly, at our accessible vote centers, um, I found out that they're sending people home because they're not very busy. <laughs> so our workers are working even more part-time. But they are very busy with drop-offs. So even City Hall, even the election center and the LUSAC, we have drop boxes at all of those locations, but people are still coming in to put the envelope in the silver ballot box at those locations, which is kind of interesting. Mr. Trady. I know, I used your the Ship Creek one. I dropped it off the box there. Great. It was easy. Right in there. Good. Thank you. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Barbara, so they're not busy in the election center. They're less busy than expected, but busy at getting the drop-offs, or what, what were you saying? Let, let me, I'm sorry, that wasn't entirely clear. We have six ABCs, accessible vote centers, and that's City Hall, the LUSAC. The election center has an accessible vote center where people can come in and vote. And then we have the new location at the Muldoon Mall, and then we must have Eagle River and the golf course. So those are the six accessible vote centers. They are not particularly busy issuing replacement ballots, but they are busy with people just dropping off right. envelopes in the um, in So that's the good silver. news. Yeah. Busy in the right way. Right. It's just people are voting by mail or voting the ballot that we mailed to them, which is good for us because it's less expensive. Um, so um, we have done, you know, probably about three or four hundred um, replacement ballots. Last year, I think we did over two thousand. Right. Oh, wow. So, so that's good news. Um, we um, have some issues that we all probably need to discuss with fax and email ballots, and that we can put on our agenda for for next meeting after the election. Last year we had 60 people vote by fax or email and we just need to, and we can talk about that signature issue. Um, and our envelope opening team is doing really well. They opened 5,000 ballots, yes, envelopes, and separated those just yesterday. And so um, everything seems to be going well. The call center, we had four people last year, we only have two this year. The calls are pretty much the same thing. I didn't get my ballot. You know, how do I get a replacement? Um, um, some other people are asking about um, the cost of the election. We've had a couple of calls about that. We, All of that information is in the Vote by Mail project report that I provided to you. And um, if you wanted to have a maybe after the election if you want to have a 15-minute work session and people could ask me <coughs> questions about that. Um, if you have any questions, I guess it's pretty straightforward. And that is about it from us. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I have a, a quick question and I'm sure you've handled it. Um, I heard at a community council someone, of course, they were confused about the piece of paper and back at that point when they called about it, the person who answered the phone wasn't sure, but I'm sure that answer is pretty fluid now. You know what I mean about the piece the, of paper for Ron Stafford? Sure piece, oh, Ron Stafford, okay. There was a piece of paper in the ballot, their ballot that said as of this time, he's currently eligible, but so people called the number. 
Um, do you know what paper I'm talking about now? I do now. The yeah, yeah, insert. Sorry. Yeah, the the Ron insert. Stafford that insert. That would be the word I should right. use. Insert. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so the first, I think in the very beginning, it was, they were a little dismayed that whoever answered the phone didn't know, but I'm assuming whoever answers the phone now is totally versed in it. Well, I will tell you at the beginning, we didn't know, right? Yeah. So, um, we, we distributed the insert on, um, we made the decision on the insert on March 6th, and then on March 7th, he filed. Okay, so he filed with APOC, and APOC made a decision, you know, they just said he's, a, he's an okay candidate as far as APOC is concerned because he filed. So I do know that APOC has copied me on a couple additional emails and they fined him. And I think the fine is like $180. <coughs> so then on Saturday the 9th, there was an expedited complaint filed against the clerk's office to remove him from the ballot. And um, then I believe on um, Tuesday or Wednesday, the expedited complaint was denied or dismissed. I'm not sure which. So, um, and then, which would have been the day that the ballots were mailed. Can you say complaint to whom? It was a complaint to APOC. Okay. They filed an expedited complaint with APOC asking us to remove him from the ballot. And then but, but APOC. The ballots were already printed by that time, so there was no way we could remove him, right? Well, if I the question is, can APOC order that? Yeah. And I think that's a different question, and we should probably review that after the election. And um, you can take a look at the APOC opinion, and then a look at our code. And I think we probably should look at that. Um, and so then, uh, in all, in spite of all of this, you know, I am getting legal advice, you know, um, and I was looking for a statement from legal, and so you are correct, the statement was not done on the 11th when the ballot packages were mailed, and I'm not positive that the statement was complete or updated until sometime that week. And so the statement is on the website now, oh, okay. and it's on the website. And it, the update is that um, Mr. Stafford filed with APOC, and he is um, considered a qualified candidate with APOC. And I, and then and that's that's as far as we're going. So yeah, it was a little dicey there for it a week be a or so. It would a good election if you didn't have a really good challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mr. Trainer. Thank you for that answer. He just we need to look into this. His only person entity that should be fairly eligible is the clerk, mm -hmm. not APOC. APOC has tried this before. One time he passed an ordinance they didn't like, and they said, well, you didn't have our permission to write a past ordinance. Do you remember what I'm talking about, Barbara? Um, I believe. Marijuana issue. Oh, that's true. And they wanted to find us. They did find us, Mr. Cheney. They, <laughs> but we paid them with. We did not admit any faults in this. But we needed to find where APOC breaches what their job is and gets into our area, the clerk's area. Because this is up to clerk to determine if somebody jumped over or not, according to city charter. It's not APOC's failure. Right. It's, it's a local election. It's not a state election. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ms. Quinn Davis. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. I totally agree with Dick. We need to sort this out, so we can work on that after the election. And then I just wanted to mention something related to what Barbara brought up, which is she referred to an email issue we had. Um, I had a constituent reach out to me who lives uh, full time. Well, she doesn't abs she doesn't do absentee, right, Barbara? She does email submission, electronic voting. But to do that, you have to have an American. Let Pete know this, but so the rest of you know, um, you have to have an American citizen verify your signature. Well, she's serving overseas in Germany, and it's sometimes difficult to find an American who's around can, who can certify her signature. So um, we've been, Barbara suggested that we put that on the agenda for next month to try to just evaluate whether there's anything we can do. Maybe we can't, maybe we can. Yeah, and that makes yeah. perfect sense to me. I, I mean, I've lived overseas before, and, and uh, you know, as a Peace Corps volunteer, 
and there's some guys there that were so far out in the middle of nowhere that yeah. they they would have had to rub their motorcycle for an hour or two to find another American, mm -hmm. and then they wouldn't have been in a position to, to do anything to verify it anyway. So, yeah. Mr. Training. Since I spent a whole 39 years in the military, every military unit has a voting officer. Mm -hmm. So what you might want to do is, if you don't have, for example, an Alaska resident, you can use a voting officer to certify that they're there. You know, something, something related to that, because every unit's got a voting officer that's appointed to make sure their people can vote. Interesting. So this may be a way to fix that. Require the judge advocate's office. Right. So if you go to the judge advocate attorney for the guard unit or the Air Force or the Army, whatever they're in. So that's each, each division has one, or how? Yeah, they've got them. And and that person is obviously an American citizen as well. So yes, they're American. So you citizen. don't even yeah they can find it whether they're the but they can certify the it. Yeah. or not. Hmm. It's just yeah, it surprised me that she had a hard time finding someone, but I don't know if she's off. You know, doing a project and well, I know the like army's got all sorts of little units all over here. Yeah. Okay. Thank it's you, just Mr. Training. For you. Yeah. You know, and we we had an, an email from another citizen who was uh, questioning the situation with sending ballots out of state, and um, I I told her that uh, these ballots that we send out are not forwarded by the post office. So unless you've changed your address uh, on your voter registration or put in for an absentee ballot, if, if your ballot goes to your P.O. box here in Anchorage, it's not going to get forwarded to Georgia or Arizona or wherever, you know? And, and so um, I, I wasn't exactly sure how these people would have gotten their ballots out of state unless they were on the purge list that we got really late. No, so th I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion, and Mr. Weddleton asked to be invited to that. Right. So um, I think you all got the email from this voter. And, and so it's a multifaceted issue, and the number one issue and the most important fact is that the clerk's office um, uses the resident's address in the state of Alaska voter registration database. And your residence address, of course, needs to be in Anchorage because you need to live in Anchorage, right? But then we all have a mailing address. As Pete said, it could be a P.O. box. Your mailing address also could be in Arizona or Thailand or someplace like that, too. So the, the question is, and I will get the numbers for you at the next meeting, how many people do we mail ballots to that have a mailing address out of state? And, and we'll get that number to you. And then the question is, um, should we be mailing ballots to voters out of state? And, and the answer is yes, if they're residents of Anchorage. And so how do we determine that? It's because the voter registration database says that they're a resident of Anchorage. The flap on the envelope when they sign says, I am a resident of Anchorage. And you know, I'm over 18, I'm a US citizen, I haven't voted elsewhere in this election. So they have an oath too. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the oath on the um, electronic ballots, we can talk about the oath on our regular envelopes. So that's the other way that even if a voter is outside, you know, they shouldn't be signing the, and returning the envelope if they're not swearing to all of that stuff. But the bigger problem that I've suggested to some of you is we may need to invite the state to discuss PFD voter registration. Because remember, anyone in the PFD database, anyone that applied for a PFD, is now getting added to the voter registration database if they have an Anchorage residence mm -hmm. and an outside mailing address they're getting a ballot mm -hmm. and we have we have 17,000 new voters this year so um, this because is of the PFD thing? well we believe that it's possibly mm -hmm. in part because of PFD voter registration we don't know exactly I will put some statistics together for okay. you, and we'll see what the increase was from, um, 
you know, 17 to 18, and then we'll take the increase from 18 to 19. But 17,000 seems to me to be a big increase yeah. in voter registration when we know that population from our AEDC meetings, population in Anchorage probably went down. Mm -hmm. I did a real cursory calculation with 235,000 registered voters in Anchorage. That's 103% of the adult population as of 2018. So more than 100% of the adult population in Anchorage is registered to vote. That, that doesn't what? sound like that's quite kosher. What do you right. Mean? We need to keep talking about this for that reason. So what it means that is that... So mm -hmm. the the numbers are really interesting. So we have, and and we'll keep. Uh, obviously, this is a problem. So there are two hundred and thirty five thousand registered voters. We mailed two hundred and sixteen thousand ballot packages. So there's a not quite the same number there, but about um, that delta is for people who are undeliverable or as Mr. Peterson said, purged notice, or people who don't have an address point in the um, MOA address. There's only 622 people. So the rest of them are undeliverable or purged notice. So they haven't voted for some time in the state system. So you authorized us by code not to mail to them. It saves us money and we don't want to mail something and have it returned. Well, we've received um, and I anticipate, you know, that's not quite 20,000, but I anticipate that we will get another 20,000 envelopes. The, the numbers to date, we're going to have 20,000 returned undeliverable. We already didn't mail 17 or 18,000, and we're going to get another 20,000 back. So we're going to be back to the numbers we were last year, 40,000 undeliverables in that 235,000. Most likely they do not live in Anchorage. The database is, um, uh, can I say bloated? Is that an okay word? It's, uh, if you say it, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Suspect. suspect. Well, I'm not gonna know. say suspect. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's bloated because those people have most likely moved. That's why their ballots are undeliverable. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so you can see that there there are some issues with this that we need to address. Ms. Mm -hmm. Wilma. Yeah. Um, thank you. I have that was actually really interesting. Um, I have two questions. Um, so the out of state, of course, PFDs are not mailed out of state, right? They, I don't know. Yeah, they're not. They're not mailed out of state. How how do how do you know that? It's they say it right on there. These cannot. Oh, they can't be forwarded. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. I thought it said that you can't mail them out of state. Well, ballots. No, I don't but I mean know the PFDs themselves. Um, I you don't. You mean the check you get? The check you get because it's all it's all, you know, it's all by bank now, so they don't have to mail many. But if, if I remember right, they don't mail out of state. But mail what? Uh, the check. The check. The check. Do, do people actually get checks? Um, I well, think there's, there's some. some. There's yeah. some. Oh, okay. But it, so so that was my my one question is if that out-of-state mailing address coincides with the PFD concept. But here's, here's a question I had when I, when I understood the purge notice. So that was my question, if, if that out-of-state, and when you were mentioning talking with the PFD office and their voter registration, if that's an issue that has impacted you. That's one question. And the other one is, on the purge notice, there was a woman, um, and I can't remember what meeting she was at, but she was at a meeting that, um, she is a resident out at Chugiak Eagle River, and she, she doesn't apply for her dividend because she's out of Alaska more than 180 days, but, but she's still an Alaska resident. She doesn't have a license anywhere else. She has her home here, et cetera, et cetera. So, but because she doesn't rely on a PFD, she lost her voter registration because it, it purged out because she hadn't been applying for voter registration. So that kind of loophole who w would she go to your office, the state office? Um, well, we should talk about that. So number one, the most important concept here is 
We get the data from the State of Alaska Division of Elections, the Voter Registration Database. It's Which the, they own. They okay. own the State of Alaska data, okay. the voter registration. We have nothing to do with that. Okay? okay. So that's really an important concept. Well, that's, that's a, a good, good answer. Because they <laughs> and they, 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 the, they do, no, that's, that's correct. educational for me. I appreciate the, it. The second thing is that purging is specified in state statute and state regulations is a very complicated detailed process for somebody to get a purge notice it means that they have not voted or not had contact with the state of Alaska Division of Elections for a number of years okay. multiple years multiple elections but it's it's specified in state statute so then the next, so that's one process, two processes. Third process is PFD. Again, I have no contact with PFD. That's not my relationship. Mm -hmm. That's a relationship between PFD and the State of Alaska Division of Elections. My understanding is that the issue is it's automatic voter registration. It's not purging voters. PFD doesn't have anything to do with purging voters. It's only registering voters. Okay. So I, I think your constituent probably needs to call the State of Alaska Division of Elections yeah. and ask them why That's she got a purge her. notice. Yeah. And the state is going to tell her what the statute says and what context they had with her and why she was given. And she might have been more confused than she thought. Yeah, so okay. I, I appreciate and I'm sorry to have taken nope. time for those, but I learned nope. quite a bit. That was a good perspective. Mr. Training. No, I went and got a real ID yesterday. And that on that form, you've got to put down, you want us to register you to vote. So that's another way they're getting people, increased mm -hmm. the amount of people voting mm -hmm. through that process. Motor voter? DMV. <laughs> yeah, you've got to go through it. You can see these issues are very complicated and um, the concept is we do not want to remove voters too soon if a voter votes once every four years in the presidential election we don't want to purge those voters from the voter registration database but I think we all have concerns and um, our concern is do we have voters that are voting on taxes or charter amendments or candidates in a municipal election that are not um, qualified voters in Anchorage because they've moved and you know the issue is then they are falsifying they haven't updated their data and then they're falsifying when they sign the envelope so those are issues that are super complicated but we probably need to address them Mr. Training? No. You, you do good? Barbara, you said earlier we're opening the the ballots up. Are we putting it through that machine that automatically opens the envelopes, or are we doing it by hand? Um, so we have a slicer dicer, yeah. and our slicer dicer, it's just a small machine. It costs about 800 bucks, and you put a stack of envelopes, and you have to kind of tap them down and then let it seal the other end so you don't slice the ballot. But then the machine can do about 100 at a time. But it's still it correctly? Well, yes, it is. Although, um, as Dick knows, Bonnie Jack is in charge of that team. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bonnie, Bonnie Jack's very precise, let me tell you. Bonnie <laughs> yes. said, you know, it, it seems a little dull. The, it's not cutting quite, you know, as accurate so as we we contacted the vendor and the vendor came out and the vendor found out that um, we opened you know 26,000 envelopes in in a week and <laughs> last year we did you know 80,000 in a couple of months and he said you have no warranty you're not going to get a warranty you need to replace it instead of this $800 machine you need this $13,000 machine and we said thank you very much, but we can get a whole bunch of eight hundred dollar machines. So, so, so do we, we need a sharp, a new blade? I mean, is there is there a replacement blade on the thing that you could? The blade lasts for the life of the machine. So oh. we have worn out a machine in one year. We thought about telling Bonnie Jack to do some meat and cheese. Maybe that will sharpen the blade. <laughs>
<laughs> so has no body jacked. Well, actually, I, I have. Yeah. She's very yeah. precise. So we are we are opening the envelopes, separating the ballots from the envelopes. We have, um, you know, pr not quite the twenty nine thousand that are through, and they're ready to start being scanned into the scanning system. We'll do that later this week. Um, you know that LURSA candidates have until five days before the election to register as a qualified write-in. Um, assembly candidates and other candidates do not have to be qualified um, because, um, but LURSA candidates do because um, we don't want to have to have a special election to fill a LURSA seat. It's very expensive for you. And so um, they have to be a qualified write-in or we don't count those votes. Um, and that's specified on the ballots. And then we'll start scanning and then we, we, we will do some adjudication, but of course we won't tabulate until election night. My, very quickly, I'm impressed with you. I'm impressed with your crew. I just, I mean, this is just amazing. Thank you for being you and doing handling this. I'm just impressed. That's all I want to say. Mm. <laughs> well, th through the chair, I will tell you the people that I want to thank are, you know, Pete, Dick, LV, Ernie, you know, um, and and all of the assembly. You know, you allocated 1.2 million for this project, and. Um, you have been working on it since about 2015 when you wanted to increase voter turnout and obviously we have had an incredible team that has been working on this since then but you know thank you for the money it's allowed us to purchase the equipment we need hire the staff that we need and it it makes a difference so thank you Mr. Trini, Christian, our goal was eventually to take, to allow our voting to be done for the entire state or for any, for any borough in Alaska. They're capable of doing that. For example, let's say the Matt Sue has come down here and looked at it. They decide they want to do it. We can do theirs for them too, or the state of Alaska. Ah. We've got a state of the art system in there. Barbara's done a great job on it. Everybody's been involved in it. But it's capable of doing more than it does. And because the reason we did it was because the system the state's using still today, AccuVote, is about a 25, 26 year old system. It's not accurate. It's not reliable. The machines, the machines are falling are apart. Are falling apart. You can't even get parts for them. Wow. Yeah, they don't make them anymore. So one day they'll have to come to us. You have to cannibalize the old machines to fix the current ones. The problem awesome. the state has is they're not all urban voters. Some are rural. And they may not have access to a post office box or something. They got more problems than we do. Ms. Jones. Um, through the chair, just to give you an update, on Monday, um, a group from the Kenai Peninsula Borough is coming to, to the election center to see what's happening. We had a meeting with them on March 15th and did a presentation about our vote by mail process. Are they interested in doing that? Well, they have, Kenai Peninsula already has several precincts because it's so big. They have several, and couldn't find election workers. So they have a couple of precincts that are by mail only. Interesting. And so now they're looking at the whole process. So, and and Dick is right. We've talked to the Matt Subaru and the clerks up there. We had the lieutenant governor there. The, the one. Right. The lieutenant governor did a tour a week or so ago. So, um, so anyway, we are having other people take a look at it and we do have capacity where some other jurisdiction could use the election center part of the year. argument was other jurisdictions couldn't afford the equipment we bought. We did spend a lot of money, Barbara said, but we needed, because our largest voting block in the state is right here. So we needed this system. Because think about it, in the past we've got Lecture Central at the Egan, at the Sullivan, and the numbers roll and it goes to one time it was till 5.30 in the morning before the numbers mm -hmm. came in. This will be done in what? After you turn the machine on to give you numbers about half an hour? Right. And But the, the one thing that we're trying to teach people is we're going to be a day behind. So, so the numbers on election night 
won't they it includes the mail that we received that morning but it won't include the mail that people mailed on election day after like you know 8 8 a.m. so that will be all processed the following day believe me it's, up, it's Barbara this whole thing is Barbara so anyway she's done a great job <laughs> Well, and, and, you just know, take it. We, we rented a building well, and it's, we're just uh, it's, employee. She's full time. Yeah. That, that has enough room so that not only will, can we handle our you know elections with two hundred and sixteen ballot two hundred sixteen thousand ballots mailed, that we could do the state and where they would be mailing more than twice that many or somewhere around twice that many. I would imagine. You know, I think it would be difficult to do the entire state out of our election center. You know, but but I anticipate the state probably could have a couple of election centers throughout the state. That would probably be it, more. Yeah, chances are Fairbanks right. wouldn't want to have anything to do with Anchorage, and they'd want to do well, it. Want to just have just, of just knowing Fairbanks as yeah. they do. So, um, Mr. Chair, <laughs> Amy Solberg, my my partner in all of this, who has done a fabulous job, got all of the ADCs set up, got all of the drop boxes purchased, sixteen drop boxes, you know, did all of the work hiring all of our workers. She's on the phone. We both can't be away from the election center. And Amy, I was wondering if you had an update for the committee. Uh, I don't. I think you covered all of it. <laughs> And, and so, again, I couldn't do this without Amy, and she's done a, a really great job. She, you all know she worked in the clerk's office. She'll be here five years in September, and, um, you know, it was a really great decision of ours to um, promote her to this position and as election coordinator, and she's doing a really great job for us. Dick? I'm sorry I didn't mention you, Amy. I just didn't see you here right now. <laughs> you the okay. How's your aunt and uncle doing? All right. They're doing great. Good. I got to stop and see them on these days soon. Yeah. Well, plus, Amy in her spare time is a little league coach, so she she's involved in the community as well. So it's I've known her family probably thirty years. Yeah, her her father's a coach, and uh, he actually plays golf as well. Um, <laughs> I actually went to our new Muldoon uh, Accessible Vote Center yesterday just to check in on them to see how they were doing and uh, um, knew the person in charge there, I've known her for many years, she used, actually used to be president of the Northeast Community Council, and uh, but they didn't have very many voters yesterday, but the one voter they had when I was there, somebody that I knew, so that was actually kind of, kind of funny, but they said it, that everything's working out and um, they have been having a lot more people coming in to drop their ballots off than actually to vote. And um, our, our new drop box at Bengage Middle School, I use that myself so that um, just because I wanted to drive over there to see how convenient it was. I never even had to get out of the build vehicle. I just rolled and you know, put my window down and dropped the ballot in. And so it was, it was very convenient, I thought. So we had good placement there. Well, thanks to Amy for that. She drove around with our moving company and helped them place everything, so. All right, well, that, that went well. All right, anything else on the elections update or we'll move to the next item on the agenda? Looks like we're gonna be talking about uh, some changes to chapter 2.70 uh, that I think we touched on just a minute in the last meeting. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Austin for the record. Um, so we've been working on uh, changes to Title II, to Chapter 2.7, which covers vacancies um, and the appointment or special election process. So uh, when I first joined the body, Forrest asked me to help with this, um, given that I had gone through a special election. We sort of initially started working on it, um, then Amy decided to leave the body, sort of paused that because we didn't want to have it seem like it was related at all of that. Then it took a while to get Gretchen on board. Then we started working on it again. Then we're approaching the election. Barbara got busier, you know, <laughs> working with all of us. The dean, um, it's just taken a little bit of time. But the good news is we think it's a really good product, and we've reviewed it so many times and thought of different hypotheticals um, and think that we have something that's pretty good. So I just sent my final comments last night. I think we have one issue we're still trying to resolve, but 
we'll probably uh, plan to bring it. What we wanted to do was bring suggested language to the committee and be able to go through it together um, and see, I think even in one uh, particular provision, we had it option one or option two, depending on what we think makes more sense as a committee. So we'll bring that forward soon and then make a recommendation to the full assembly. All right. Any I just want to say, Dean, sure. Dean and Barbara and Austin have done a lot of work on this. I mean, it's, it's, it's a case of not just kind of dealing with it. They're looking at everything and making sure it's really clear which really impressed me when I came on board. I'm like, wow. So, and, and very needed considering that in, in one year you had both uh, two vacancies that weren't anticipated and, and they, one was an election and one was an appointment. So, uh, I'm, anyway, they've done a lot of work on it. Well, you, you do have to update this information or these laws, codes regularly because as times change, you know, modernization happens, and so you got to try to keep up with the times. And then also sometimes you see what other jurisdictions are doing, and you go, wow, hey, that's kind of a good idea. I wonder if that's how that's working out for them. And so you get some feedback, and, and then you, you realize, well, we can make improvements here. And, and so, uh, but it always probably takes a little longer uh, than, yeah. than you would hope, especially when you, you you, once you get close to election season, you know, it, you, if, if you saw the deadlines that Barbara I had know. sent out, you know, you have, this has to be done by this time, and you know, all the timing and everything. So you, you got to back it up from election day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so those last three months, actually, you're pretty, you know, pretty stacked with the things that have to be done on time. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, and I might just add something. Mr. Chair, um, we have we're not proposing a lot of substantive changes. Actually, it's more cleaning it up and making it read really well and understandable. Because I think sometimes it's been confusing what pe to even people who are like, yeah. "Oh, we think this is what it means," but you sort of have to read between the lines. And um, you're saying there might be something called legalese. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just trying to make it more um, more straightforward, and so that. Yeah, everyone feels like the process is fair and easy to understand. Do you have anything to add, Barbara? No, I think that's a great understanding. I sometimes make a little joke that I really like cookbook code. And, you know, Dean is really a great code writer. And, you know, he'll do lots of um, A's and then one, two, threes. And, you know, I think for, for me and my staff, when we're implementing code for the assembly, it makes it a lot easier for us. And I think it makes it easier for the public, too, because then the public can read it and understand it. And it puts all of us in an awkward position when someone from the public calls and says, what does this mean? And, you know, we don't interpret code. Um, and then you have to either and, and you call legal and, and you know they don't need to do that for simple code things like filling a vacancy. The public should be able to understand it. So I agree with you 100%. I think this is going to really help the assembly members. It's going to help the public and it's going to help potential candidates mm -hmm. and um, for all of us. So yeah. I'm really, really happy we're doing it. Yeah, me too. A lot of back and forth, the track changes between me and Dean, arguing over subsections <laughs> and how to do titles. Well, a lot of fun lawyer talk. When, when we did a rewrite of the ethics code here a couple of years ago, we, we tried to do the same thing. And, you know, it was like 19 pages or whatever it was, and it was, it was real complicated. And so, peop, you know, assembly members were having to go. Uh, to the ethic board to try to ask them about what they thought was fairly simple wow. stuff, but then, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry, so to speak. And so, so they actually had a lot of, uh, of inquiries that the board was having to handle that they thought were probably too routine. And so when we went in and, and rewrote the code, they tried to simplify it and shorten it. And, and I actually think we did a pretty good job of that. Mr. Trini. First time we had a civil ethics code. And then it expanded immensely. And then what you're talking about is an attempt to rewrite it, to rein it in, to make it something people could understand. Barbara was here for that. 
Yeah, Dick would Dick would say, I want five pages. No more yeah. than five pages. I know it's more than five pages, but he tried to get him to keep it to five pages. Crazy. Yeah, I, I think we almost cut it in half. I think we started with 19, ended up with 11 or 10 and a half mm -hmm. or something. And I, I know that still sounds like a lot of all the pages, and, that, and there is a ton of information there, but it's it's more easily understood now, I believe, than... <coughs> the way it was before for for us non attorneys. Um, well, of course, Barbara is an attorney in hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Recovering Me attorney. Too. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> we like to see recovery. Well, you know, it helps to have someone with um, a legal background as 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 the clerk because there yes. are a lot of a lot of things in code that aren't so easily understood all the time, mm -hmm. and and so. She, she can give give us her opinion without having to go to D or Dean because they actually are already f fairly fairly busy and so if, if we can get a good interpretation from our clerk then that saves time on the, the other uh, other lawyers so, um, anything else we want to talk about about uh, mm -hmm. chapter 2.7 vacancies or special elections today We'll probably put that on the agenda for next month and we can have a more in-depth uh, review of uh, the, the changes and maybe Ms. Quinn Davidson will handle that at our next meeting. Is that sure, something? can I um, ask, so we usually meet, so this meeting will be, the next one will be end of April, April so that's April 24th. So we'll just need to make sure do you think that given the election and everything going on with that, that we'll be able to all meet and finalize something before April 24th? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mine is just really quick that um, I, this, may, this obviously I won't be on the assembly after the 16th, um, but uh, you know, I, I'd certainly be willing to come in as an audience member so I'm available. You, yeah. you can be and a member yeah. of the public. Yeah, yeah. Trini and like. Eugene will be our new. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But <laughs> uh, I mean, just to, we'll be on the just in case there's any questions that may refer to me, I will make sure I'm here. Great. And I just, um, I guess I'm going to do this swan song all the time. But it's been it's been real, <laughs> and it has been fun, and it's been educating. So thank you. And you were the one that actually asked me if I wanted to be on this committee. I'm going. Oh yeah. So I'm really glad I got to be on this committee because I've, I've learned an immense amount. And boy, I've, there's a lot to learn. You can't know everything. So anyway, thank you. Yes, I will come back as an audience member on the 24th, just in case something goes on. But hopefully we'll meet before then or something. Okay. Yeah, I think I had proposed in the latest email a couple dates, and then we'll okay. see what works for okay. these. I think cool. I did. Maybe I'm cool. Do you have something, Mr. Training? Gretchen covered it. I just wanted to let you guys know we're not going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well I, I, you know, I, I appreciate, appreciate your, your service. I'm sure to find this election. I'll <laughs> 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 be here as an audience member. Mr. You need Chair, some buddies. I, I might like to suggest an hour and a half for your meeting in April. You know, it'll be a good time. We've got um, the APOC issue, the signature issue, email. Um, issue and then this ballot issue and I I don't mean to defer all of these things it's just in my opinion we don't want to discuss um, issues that affect voters during this election right. so we have to wait until after the election but I would like to suggest an hour and a half that would give us plenty of time oh, yeah to I mean we zip through an hour every time we meet an hour and we don't even get through the whole thing so I actually think we we'll probably would need an hour for our conversation okay. alone, don't you think? Yeah, so should we book it for two hours then? Well, we, we can. Okay, good. You know, and we also at some point in time have to look at code and figure out and discuss uh, ballot harvesting because we had that big problem down in North Carolina, which they actually are going to have to have a special election now. They totally threw out the results of that election. And the, one of the guys is actually indicted, I believe, uh, that was harvesting ballots down there. Well, Mr. Chair, I think Amy has ballot harvesting on the next agenda. She also has the issue that we talked about the last meeting about the um, 
the mapping issues that we need to work on. So that was on the agenda as well. So I think two, two hours is good, but I think some of those we might have to defer until June. Yeah. And and we'll get together with you and order that agenda. Okay, that sounds good. Now, I just wanted to make sure we still have that on our radar screen because I actually, myself, personally, don't like the idea of ballot harvesting. I, I think that could get into a situation um, uh, where it might it might be unfair, you know, depending on the person doing the, the harvesting the ballots. You know, we, we had a, a little bit of a problem uh, with the state election in East Anchorage uh, last year, and so people are still questioning whether that all went down fairly and perfectly and correctly. And, and we, we don't want those kind of questions with our municipal elections. And so we, we need to figure out exactly what we're going to allow and not going to allow as far as someone. I mean, I don't have a problem someone mailing their spouse's ballot or their children's ballot if they're already filled out or whatever. But going around door to door and that and trying to get people to give you your ballot makes me think that they might actually be filling the ballot out themselves or trying to get them to fill it out a certain way and and I don't I don't necessarily think I want to want to have that happen it just as uh, that's my my own personal opinion but if Mr. you Kennedy, had a mini harvesting problem going on there the state election in Ladoon area I know we know the same election we're talking about oh yeah there's a mini harvesting going on there that was not a good situation so I mean the last thing you want to have is started to have large numbers of people questioning whether it's a fair election or not. And um, so we'll, that's definitely on our radar and it'll be on the agenda coming up fairly soon. I think we are uh, down now um, to audience participation if there's anyone in the audience who would like to participate. Going Come on, once, Eugene. Going twice. You know, you're always holding out on us. All right. My name is Eugene Carl Haberman. I live in the Maxwell Valley. Follow the public process. When the public process is done appropriately, the decision made by the governing body is more like public interest. Uh, my comment first is something that you probably didn't expect me to speak on, but it does concern the elections. Okay, is the announcement that I heard at the Federation of Community Councils meeting, plural, uh, last week. A constant, some of constant training of members were present, but I'm not sure they were present when the announcement came from the chief of staff and the mayor, Owner Rouse. And they were noting about the election night scenario. An election night meaning it wouldn't be in the normal place. They seemed to indicate that it was going to be at election center. Now, I'm really <coughs> want to express my, my protest. Now, with all due respect, I appreciate the sensitivity of making sure that that equipment and everything is secure and confidential and all that. But that's not a room and place for an election night. I remind you what election night is, for who haven't seen God those election nights. There are rallies, there are people walking in, signs, all that. And we all know in that, in that section, there are lines where people can't walk around, designated areas, and you've got equipment and people dealing with the election of all things. That's a place that basically should be more secure. It's not a place for what we call election night. You can do certain things with limitations, but not have a place to have the community as a whole come to a election center. And it also reminds you to live in parking, the, uh, the lighting, and all that stuff. This is not a place. And all the Prowse chief of staff made the note, note of that, that they were putting it over there. Now, this is, I was concerned. I didn't have a chance because time limit didn't allow public to speak at that meeting. If there's public time, I'll give you an example. I would have said something there. All my head walked out. I haven't been able to address concern to her since then, but of all things at this meeting, I think it's quite appropriate to bring that in, issue out. And I do appreciate the consciousness of efforts of the staff and election workers trying to do their job right and secure, election commissioners and all that, and the assembly. But look what's going about to happen in just a few days. Now, maybe I was unclear, maybe it was not what was said by Ona Browse, but it seemed to interpret it, that's what, that was what's being said. And uh, I also want to say in conclusion with 33 seconds to spare, I formally protest any, any use of that equipment, election equipment, being used other for election 
elections in Anchorage, not for the borough elections, not for any other elections. This is equipment for Anchorage elections, and it should have nothing tied in with any of the other elections. There's nothing wrong with showing the equipment to other parties looking for a means of changing their equipment in the state. But there's no place for having Matsu Borough elections, my new resident of Matsu Borough, and Kenai whatsoever to have any of that equipment being used. And I will address that concern to other parties. Thank you very much. We have zero seconds to spare. <laughs> yeah, you Ms. made it a little too early on the 33 seconds Ms. to spare. Ms. There. Jones. Um, through the chair, may I address Mr. Haberman's comment? I think we still have a little bit of time left. It, it is true that um, Election Central will be at the Election Center. Um, it will start at 8.30 p.m. It will be after the polls close. There is still no um, campaigning uh, allowed. Uh, we have plans for parking across the street from the election center. We'll have parking attendance. We have parking attendance anyway on election night. Um, we do have an area that will be um, cordoned off that will be for the election central gathering. We have talked to, one of the reasons we're doing this is it'll save about $3,000. Um, that there's a cost for using the Dedina, and so it'll save that cost. The other issue is that then um, groups don't have to be in both places. And there was an allegation last year that the delay, because it's, you know, we take the data on the thrun drive off of the results computer and then upload it to the website, and then it has to transmit and we're printing paper copies, people had the information at the election center before they had it at election central, and people thought that that was unfair. And so it'll be in one place, and everyone will get it at the same time. And that was some of the motivation for it. All of the processes will be complete by the time election central starts down there, we are asking people, uh, the press, to RSVP to make sure that we have enough space. They will be separated. Um, we have security. So I think we're trying to, um, all of our processes will be complete. There will be no ballots on the floor or envelopes or anything. So we do think that um, we're proceeding correctly for security, but for other reasons, you know, the expense, and um, the dilemma of t people having to be in two places at one time. It's not a rally and people can't campaign there. So, but that's what we, how we are proceeding. Right, and, and you know, I actually was at Election Central last uh, April and uh, there wasn't very many people there. Yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, it was a party that came. Yeah, it was, it, and, you know, the press was there and they're going, where is everybody? And we're going, well, it's a vote by mail election. And so, well, you know, quite a few of the ballots are going to be counted tomorrow and then in the, in the next upcoming days. And, and so I, I think anticipating that there's not going to be a huge crowd is probably the right way to go. Mr. Traney and then Ms. Wemple. We knew the cost was going to be a factor. We talked about this before. So it makes sense to have a bunch of center on Ship Creek because we have to pay for the and we have to pay for Egan Center. We don't need that cost. We're trying to reduce the cost of government down because the state's cutting a lot of our money off. So it makes sense to do it this way. And quite frankly, going to Election Central was a result of precinct voting. Society changes. We're going to vote by mail. It's a different way to do it. And people just get used to it. Factor of life. Um, you know, actually, it might, it might help a lot of people outside of it on this trickle-down concept. Because I know that the first year I, I belonged to a political organization and we were going to have our own little election central because we heard there wasn't going to be one. And then all of a sudden there was one. But what happens is people, real, this, people will realize this is not a rally point, but this is where you get information. But people can still have their own rally times. So different organizations can still do their rally and the news will, the news will follow them. So I... I uh, and there won't be alcohol at the election center, right? That is correct. There will Afterwards, not be any alcohol. Afterwards, you will have some. 
Just not at you. the election center. <laughs> not at the election center. <laughs> yeah. The assembly will yeah. not approve a liquor license for that center. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's an interesting concept, and I'm open-minded about this. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch this because I, I think that's what happened. Well, um, yeah. Because it's an amazing process. Oh. Well, well, and candidates will probably still select uh, a place that sells adult beverages, and they'll meet for the last couple of hours, possibly before, you know, uh, the uh, the 8 p.m. voting deadline, and then if they want to decide that they want to move down to the election center at 8:30 uh, and see, you know, how many ballots have been counted up to that point and who's in the lead, then they they can certainly do that this way. Gretchen, and my last that's comment, because I know we're I don't know what the rules are about time, but. But I think the other thing this does is it does make it a more clean public, here's the results right away for those people and the press um, that want to be there but aren't really into the party. So I'm right, so the sorry. candidates will, 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 will have, it, have it figured out that they, uh, that they don't have to stick around and wait for the next four and a half hours until that final precinct comes in. Because uh, I've, I've been in that situation and you know that you, there, you know one precinct, you're not sure which one it is, but you know you got one out there yet, and, you, and so you're sitting there, and, and by the time the one election that I was involved in, by the time the last precinct came in, everyone pretty much had gone home except for the candidate and some of their friends and the campaign manager, you know? And, and so I, I think with the vote by mail, though, once they put the numbers up there, then they're going to realize, well, they're not going to be updated in the next 15 minutes or half hour. Those are the numbers for tonight. You know, they are what they are. Pete, I will tell you, 91. Results came in for 2 for 6 at 5.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Okay? Never do you want to see that ever again. <laughs> Yeah, okay. There's a better way to do it. Well, I think we've done our hour here today, so I'm going to adjourn the meeting, and we'll have another one next month. Meeting adjourned. All right.